In this video, you learn about some of the classic neural network architectures, starting with LearnNet5, and then AlexNet, and then VGGNet. Let's take a look. Here's the LearnNet5 architecture. You start off with an image, which um, say 32 by 32 by 1, and the goal of LearnNet5 was to recognize handwritten digits. So maybe an image of a digit like that. And LearnNet5 was trained on grayscale images, which is why it's 32 by 32 by 1. This neural network architecture is actually quite similar to the last example you saw last week. In the first step, you use a set of six 5 by 5 filters with a stride of 1. Because you use six filters, you end up with a 28 by 28 by 6 over there. And with a stride of 1 and no padding, the image dimensions reduces from 32 by 32 down to 28 by 28. Then the Lynette neural network applies pooling. And back then, when this paper was written, people used average pooling much more. If you're building a modern variant, you probably use max pooling instead. But in this example, you average pool, and with a filter width of 2 and a stride of 2, you wind up reducing the dimensions, the height and width, by a factor of 2. So you now end up with a 14 by 14 by 6 uh, volume. And I guess the height and width of these volumes aren't entirely drawn to scale. You know, technically, um, if I were drawing these volumes to scale, the height and width would be shrunk by a factor of 2. Next, you apply another convolutional layer. Um, this time, you use a set of 16 filters that are 5 by 5. So you end up with 16 channels in the next volume. And back when this paper was written, in 1998, people didn't really use padding, or you're always using valid convolutions, which is why every time you apply a convolutional layer, the height and width shrinks. So that's why here you go from 14 by 14 down to 10 by 10. Then another pooling layer, so that reduces the height and width by a factor of 2, and you end up with 5 by 5 over here. And if you multiply out these numbers, 5 by 5 by 16, this um, multiplies out to 400, right? That's 25 times 16 is 400. And the next layer is then a um, fully connected layer that fully connects each of these uh, 400 nodes with every one of 120 neurons. So there's a fully connected layer. And sometimes I would draw out you know, explicitly a layer with 400 nodes, but I'm skipping that here. So there's a fully connected layer, and then another fully connected layer. And then the final step is it uses these, you know, essentially 84 features and uses it with uh, one final output. I guess you could draw one more node here to make a prediction for y hat. And, and y hat took on 10 possible values corresponding to recognizing each of the digits from 0 to 9. A modern version of this neural network would use a softmax layer with um, a 10-way classification output, although back then, Lynette 5 actually used a different classifier at the output layer, one that's uh, used less today. So this neural network was small by modern standards, had about 60,000 parameters, and today you often see neural networks with anywhere from 10 million to 100 million parameters, and it's not unusual to see networks that are you know, literally about a thousand times bigger than this network. But one thing you do see is that as you go deeper in the net network, so as you go from left to right, the height and width tend to go down. So you went from 32 by 32 to 28 to 14 to 10 to 5, whereas the number of channels tends to increase. So it goes from uh, 1 to 6 to 16, um, as you go deeper into the layers of the network. One other pattern you see in this neural network that's still often repeated today is that you might have some one or more conf layers followed by a pooling layer, and then one or sometimes more than one conf layer followed by a pooling layer, and then some fully connected layers, and then the output. Right? So this type of uh, arrangement of layers is quite common. Now finally, this is uh, maybe only for those of you that want to try reading the paper. Um, there are a couple other things that were different. The rest of this uh, slide, I'm going to make a few more advanced comments only for those of you that want to try to read this um, classic paper. And so everything I'm going to write in red, you can safely skip on this slide. Um, and this may be an interesting historical footnote 
that is okay if you don't follow fully. Um, so it turns out that if you read the original paper, back then people used sigmoid and 10H nonlinearities, and uh, people weren't using ReLU nonlinearities back then. So if you look at the paper, you see sigmoid and 10H referred to. And there were also some funny ways about this network was wired, at least funny by modern standards. So for example, you've seen how um, if you have a NH by NW by NC network with NC channels, then you use F by F by the same NC dimensional filter, where every filter looks at every one of these channels. But back then, computers were much slower. And so to save on computation as well as on parameters, the original Lynette 5 had some crazy complicated way where different filters would look at different channels of the input block. And so the paper talks about those details, but a more modern implementation you know, wouldn't have that type of uh, complexity these days. And then one last thing that was done uh, back then, I guess, but isn't really done right now, is that the original Lynette 5 had a nonlinearity um, after pooling. Right. And I think it actually uses a sigmoid nonlinearity uh, after the pooling layer. So if you do read this paper, and this is one of the harder ones to read, of the ones we'll go over in the next few videos, um, the next one might be an easier one to start with. Most of the ideas on this slide are described in sections 2 and 3 of the paper, and later sections of the paper talk about some other ideas. Um, it talked about something called the graph transformer network, which isn't widely used today. So if you do try to read this paper, I recommend focusing on really on section two, which talks about this architecture, and maybe take a quick look at section three, which has a bunch of experimental results, which are pretty interesting. The second example of a neural network I want to show you is AlexNet, named after Alex Trzewski, who was the first author of the uh, paper describing this work. The other authors were Ilya Suskever and Jeffrey Hinton. So AlexNet inputs starts with 227 by 227 by 3 images. Oh, and uh, if you read the paper, the paper refers to 224 by 224 by 3 images. But if you look at the numbers, I think that the numbers make sense only if actually 227 by 227. And then the first layer applies a set of 96 uh, 11 by 11 filters with a stride of 4. And because it uses a large stride of 4, the dimension shrinks to 55 by 55. So roughly going down by a factor of 4 because of the large stride. And then it applies max pooling with a 3 by 3 filter. So f equals 3 and a stride of 2. So this reduces the volume to uh, 27 by 27 by 96. And then it performs a 5x5 five five same convolution, so with padding. So you end up with 27x27x276. Um, uh, Max pooling again, this then reduces the height and width to 13. And then another same convolution, so same padding. So it's 13x13 13 by, 13 by now uh, 384 filters. And then 3x3, three three, uh, same convolution again, gives you that. Then 3 by 3, um, same convolution, gives you that. Then max pool um, brings it down to 6 by 6 by 256. If you multiply out these numbers, 6 times 6 times 256, that's 9,216. So we're going to unroll this into uh, 9,216 nodes. And then finally, it has a few fully connected layers. And then finally, it uses a softmax to output which one of um, 1,000 classes the object could be. So this uh, neural network actually had a lot of similarities to Lynette, but it was much bigger. So whereas Lynette or Lynette 5 from the previous slide had 60,000, about 60,000 parameters, this AlexNet had about 60 million parameters. And the fact that it could take, you know, pretty similar basic building blocks, but have a lot more hidden units and train it on a lot more data, it was trained on the ImageNet dataset that allowed it to have uh, this remarkable performance. Uh, another aspect of this architecture that made it much better than Lynette was using the ReLU activation function.
And then again, just uh, if you read the paper, some more advanced details that you don't really need to worry about if you don't read the paper. One is that um, when this paper was written, GPUs were still a little bit slower, so it had a complicated way of training on two GPUs. And the basic idea was that a lot of these layers was actually split across two different GPUs, and there was a thoughtful way for when the two GPUs would um, communicate with each other. And the paper also, the original AlexNet architecture, also had another type of layer called a local response normalization. And this type of layer isn't really used much, which is why I didn't talk about it. But the basic idea of local response normalization is if you look at one of these blocks, one of these volumes that we have on top, let's say for the sake of argument, this one, you know, 13 by 13 by 256. What local response normalization, LRN, does is it'll look at one position, so one position height and width, and look down this across all the channels, look at all 256 numbers and normalize them. And the motivation for this local response normalization was that for each position in this uh, 13 by 13 image, maybe you don't want too many neurons with a very high activation. But subsequently, many researchers have found that this doesn't help that much. So uh, this, this is one of those ideas that I guess I'm drawing in red because uh, it's less important for you to understand this one. And in practice, I don't really use local response normalizations uh, you know, really in, in the networks that I would train today. So if you're interested in the history of deep learning, I think uh, even before AlexNet, deep learning was starting to gain traction in speech recognition and a few other areas. But um, it was really this paper that convinced a lot of the computer vision community to take a serious look at deep learning, to convince them that deep learning really works in computer vision. And then it grew on to have a huge impact, uh, not just in computer vision, but beyond computer vision as well. And if you want to try reading some of these papers yourself, and you really don't have to for this course, but if you want to try reading some of these papers, this one is one of the easier ones to read, so this might be a good one to take a look at. So whereas AlexNet had a relatively complicated architecture, there are just a lot of hyperparameters, right, where you, know, you have all these numbers that um, Alex Trzewski and his co-authors had to come up with. Let me show you a third and final example in this video called the VGG or the VGG16 network. And a remarkable thing about the VGG16 net is that they said instead of having so many hyperparameters, let's use a much simpler network where you focus on just having conf layers that are just 3 by 3 filters with a stride of 1 and always use the same padding and make all your max pooling layers 2 by 2 with a stride of 2. And so one very nice thing about the VGG network was it really simplified these neural network architectures. So let's go through the architecture. So you start off with an image, and then the first two layers are convolutions, which uh, are therefore these 3x3 three three filters. Um, and in the first layers, first two layers, you use 64 filters. So you end up with a 224 by 224 because you're using same convolutions, and then with 64 channels. So because VGG16 is a relatively deep network, I'm going to not draw all the volumes here. So what this little picture denotes is what we would previously have drawn as this uh, 224 by 224 by 3, and then a convolution that results in, I guess, a 224 by 224 by 64, so it'd be drawn as a deeper volume, and then another layer that results in, you know, 224 by 224 by 64. So this conf64 times 2 re represents that you're doing two layers, two conf layers with 64 filters. And as I mentioned earlier, the filters are always 3 by 3 um, with a stride of 1, and they're always same convolutions. So rather than drawing all these volumes, I'm just going to use text to represent this network. Next uh, then uses a pooling layer. So the pooling layer will reduce, and think about it, it goes from 224 by 224 down to what? Right, it goes to 112 by 112 by 64. And then it has a couple more conf layers. So this means it has a um, 128 filters. And because these are the same convolutions, let's see, what's the new dimension? Right, it'll be 
112 by 112 by 128. Um, and then pooling layer, so you can figure out what's the new dimension, right? So it'll be that. And now three conv layers with 256 dimensional filters, with two, 256 filters, sorry. Then a pooling layer, and then a few more conv layers, pooling layer, um, more conv layers, pooling layer. And then it takes uh, this final 7x7x512, seven by seven by feeds it to a fully connected layer, fully connected with 4096 4, units, and then a softmax output, one of a thousand classes. And the, um, by the way, the 16 in the name VG16 refers to the fact that this has 16 layers that have weights. Um, and this is a pretty large network. This network has a total of about 138 million parameters. And that's pretty large, even by modern standards. But the simplicity of the VGG16 architecture made it quite appealing. You can tell this architecture is really quite uniform. There's a few conf layers followed by a pooling layer, which reduces the height and width. Right? So the pooling layers reduce the um, height and width. And you have a few of them here. But then also, if you look at the number of filters in the conf layers, here you have 64 filters and then you double to 128, double to 256, double to 512. And then I guess the authors thought 512 was big enough and didn't double it again here. But this, you know, sort of roughly doubling on every step or doubling uh, through every stack of conf layers was another simple principle used to design the architecture of this network. And so I think the relative uniformity of this architecture made it quite attractive to uh, researchers. The main downside was that it was a pretty large network in terms of the number of parameters you had to train. Oh, and uh, if you read the literature, you sometimes see people talk about VGG19. That's an even bigger version of this uh, network. And you can see the details in the paper cited at the bottom by Karen Simeon and Andrew Zissiman. Um, but because VGG16 does almost as well as VGG19, a lot of people will use VGG16. But the thing I liked most about this was that this made this pattern of how as you go deeper, height and width goes down. It just goes down by a factor of two each time for the pooling layers, whereas the number of channels increases. And here it you know roughly goes up by a factor of two uh, every time you have a new set of conv layers. So by making uh, the rate at which these goes down and that go up, very systematic. I thought this paper was uh, very, um, very attractive from that perspective. So that's it for the three classic architectures. Uh, if you want, you should be able to now read some of these papers. I recommend starting with the AlexNet paper, followed by the VGGNet paper, and then the Lynette paper is a bit harder to read, but it is a good classic if you want to take a look at that. But next, uh, let's go beyond these classic networks and look at some even more advanced, even more powerful neural network architectures. Let's go on to the next video.